I read one of your tweets and you mentioned something. Something about starting a company is like fighting Mike Tyson at his prime or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like fighting peak Mike Tyson. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Because you're gonna you're gonna get punched in the face every day. We're currently valued at ten to fifteen million, and the goal is basically by end of year to be valued at over fifty million. I don't recommend most people to become founders. It's like playing in the big leagues. Peace and power. Welcome to Raw Success Podcast. Today we got a special guest who specializes in the world that I have no knowledge about. It's like a totally different language. He's one of the brightest minds that I've encountered and one of the most generous. I mean, t when you talk about generosity in, the, in, in as far as sharing wisdom, you know, amongst my circle of friends and associates and everywhere I go, I'm usually known as the one who speaks the most. But when I'm with July Gruyong, <laughs> listen, my mouth is closed, ears and antennas open, and I mean, he just drops a wealth of wisdom. And so we have him as a guest today. Welcome, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, thank you. every time I'm with him, man, it's like you talk about a podcast on steroids, school <laughs> on steroids. So we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I want to talk about some of your the, the things you've accomplished. I mean, he's the co-founder and CEO of Netty Worth. He manages, so Netty Worth, not he, the company <laughs> manages over 4 million of user managed assets. He has over 4,000 monthly users. He's, he's backed by a $75 million venture company called Blockchain Founder Fund. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're talking about 15 years of scaling business experiences. Former marketer for a fintech. Yeah, for a fintech company. Yes, yes. I, I mean, he, he developed, uh, and, and forgive me, this isn't my language, a DeFi app. Yeah, so we're basically creating the first social media app for the Web3 space, which is, we could say, for the Web3 space. Yeah. So it's a Web3 social DeFi app that's going to allow users to chat, manage, and borrow against their assets. Wow. So this is very different than, like, uh, the traditional social platforms that we've all been accustomed to knowing. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And, you know, earlier when we started the conversation, I spoke about your generosity. I want to share a story. So I own my first NFT because of July yeah. and <laughs> me being technologically handicapped, which is something I need to get better at. He literally stood on the phone with me for an hour plus walking me through every step. So yes. we're talking about not only did he share the wisdom with me, but he actually like what, like on the phone, okay, press this button. No, go here. Do you <laughs> see this? I mean, th this man really wants people to win. Yes. And, and he, he backs it. You know, he yeah. just he, he shows and proves anything. Whenever you reach out to him, he's there. And so I just want to say as your friend, uh -huh. you know, I'm here to talk about and highlight your accomplishments. But I just want you to know, as your friend, I am so grateful for your generosity. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love the fact that you like brought up like how tedious I had to like help you. Yes. Through that process, because like one of the things was uh, like when we were creating Nettyworth, we looked at the journey of like non-tech users. Mm. And we said, all right, there's about 12 steps here that someone has to know or do in order for them to become fluid in Web3. And we started looking at each of these steps and said, how do we help someone create a, a, a digital wallet easy? Check. How, how, do we, how do we help people discover uh, new opportunities, right? Like investment opportunities, check by creating that social element, right? Wow. So now you don't need someone like, you know, someone else doesn't need a July to help them, right? Yes, they just yes. need to go to nettyworth.io and they're going to be able to create their own wallet in a second. They're going to be wow. able to buy crypto in seconds. They're going to be able to talk with others and understand what's going on in the space without needing that, you know, that help, you know, holding hands to like, hey, this is how you set something up. Wow. So I, I love that you brought it up because that's yeah. one of the things that in order to get millions of users into the Web3 space, uh, 
we, uh, the industry has to do a better job at onboarding these users. Absolutely. Right. So very good. But, uh, you know, at that time, about a year and a half ago, that was the process. And I think you're going to see a big difference over the next few months. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I remember when this was just an idea. I remember when I went to your house and you gave me a T-shirt. Yeah. You literally, <laughs> you were showing me the website. Like yeah, you yeah, just yeah, yeah. started it. You, you was like, yo, I got a lot t-shirts. of changes. <laughs> yeah, let me get a t-shirt. Yeah. Man. And so it, it's just like, it's just so profound that um, like, I know you for real and to know that you've accomplished so much. Yeah. And, and, and I know you've been doing like the, the, like the hard work. Yeah. The grunt, you know, like, so I, I'm, I'm, I always say this, like, I'm definitely proud of like what we're building. I definitely do have like a hard thing of like, oh, we succeeded and we accomplished, yeah. right? Because the road is so long, right? It's so far, right? Like right. And we know what's coming, right? But it's just that I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I appreciate it a hundred percent internally. It's just like, no, we got to, yeah. you know, we're going to, you know, we're currently valued at 10 to 15 million. And the goal is basically by end of year to be valued at over 50 million, wow. right? And that's like an enormous task. Like, uh, I, I, I don't recommend most people to become founders, uh, but yeah, it's like a, it's, it's like playing in the big leagues. <laughs> no, and, and, and it's interesting you say that because I know I read one of your tweets and you mentioned something and forgive me, I'm going to chop it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about starting a company is like fighting Mike Tyson at his prime or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like fighting peak Mike Tyson. Yes. yes yeah, yes. yeah. Cause it's you're going to, you're going to get punched in the face every day. Wow. Right. And wow. it's going to be hard. Uh, you know, I, um, you know, some some folks that are just listening in, uh, but there's a, a combinator, a incubator uh, that's called the YC Combinator from San Francisco. And, you know, they they've uh, I mean, so many great founders have gone through their program. And one of the you know, one of the leading figures there, his name is Michael. He's, uh, I think one of the co-founders of Twitch. Mm. And he says, you know, creating a startup, it's like walking this path where you're, it's like, it's dark, mm. it's cold, you're alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah. And you're going to get beat up every yeah. single day. So where do you find that the passion to keep going? Is this something that has, you've it, always been driven to do? Or? Uh, uh, I mean, I've always been passionate about like, business and um technology i think i think this is like you know I, I i always say this like i think a lot of great founders have really big goals mm -hmm. in their life mm. that a lot of times sometimes sometimes they'll go outside of just the company that they're building you know for me i think netty worth which again it's just the concept of your net worth it was like it, I was so passionate about like, what if we help a new generation understand their net worth, mm. right? And and I feel like, you know, like people don't walk around that around that, right? Like I understand pop culture, right? Like I come from the <laughs> inner city. People don't talk about, hey, what's your net worth? What's the, mm -hmm. they, you know, they they don't talk about that. They might talk about credit score. Mm -hmm. Right. Like between friends. Um, but, you know, bringing that type of concept into the conversation mm -hmm. now makes everyone's like, hold on. But what is my net worth? Yeah. But what is my debt versus my net worth? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where I was super passionate about and um, and helping people understand the way money works and investment works. Um, and that's again, that's why I created the app. And I think, you know. I think is understanding that someone's going to benefit off of what we're doing that. that lives in like, you know, this country I've never been to a city I've never known. Yes. And, you know, is going to say, wow, you know, I use this technology and it improved my financial life and, and it affected my family. I think mm -hmm. that like, if you were like, okay, what is the dollar value of doing that? I can't tell you. Right. Like, I think it's, you know, I think it, it it surpasses any amount that I could pretend, uh, I I could honestly earn myself. Yes, yeah. and, and, and I could tell you, as someone who grew up, I know poor is relative, but you know, I'm from the hood, single parent home. My yeah. mother's, you know, from Dominican Republic, worked at a factory. Just to know that a man like you has created something very user friendly, where somebody like me, not only like I didn't grow up financially educated. 
and also and just based on my age and, and that's not an excuse right but for yeah. me I, I think age does matter I think know? I think a lot uh, I think a lot of people a lot of even people outside of the inner city uh you know uh academically like the country does not teach people about money. Right. Right. So there's a lot of people that are successful in the in the world of like salaries, mm -hmm. but they're poor with money. Right. Meaning Absolutely. meaning they don't know how to spend, they don't know how to invest, uh, they don't know how to buy valuable, you know, goods, you know, and all that stuff. So yeah, like not so you knock yourself down like yeah. on that. Like there are people that in the outside, people will say, Oh, they're making quarter of a million dollars they're doing good they're successful but they're actually very poor when it comes to money wow wow yeah and and, and, and what would you say to somebody who so like oh well, first before i go there let me ask you yeah why is it important for someone to ask themselves what is my net worth i think it's to understand to to, to understand where you're at and and what your goals are right so so think of this right like why do people care about their credit score Mm. because they want to go buy a house, which I, <laughs> that, I, I, I have a, 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 a harsh thing on that, but I'm not really sitting next to a realtor. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Got it. Uh, but yeah, like, um, um, I, I don't think that, um, like buying a home is like the best financial thing for people to do. But I, I will say this, it's what a lot of people have known, um, but yeah, like why do people care about their credit score? They usually care about their credit score for three things. Consumer products, like meaning I want a credit card so I can buy these things that are not worth money. Right. Or I want to buy a car that's going to devalue at a significant rate the first year or two. Uh, or I want to buy a house that's, you know, going to grow at a lower percent than the market. Right. Like, so all these type of things, but right. So why your net worth? Because it, it helps you understand where you're at. It helps you understand what are your goals, what are your financial goals, and by the way, they could be whatever you want. Like I'm not here. Like at the end of the day, is what makes people happy. If right. buying a house right. makes you happy, if buying a Porsche 911 is what fulfills your entire life, like go go for it. Save up for it. Invest. Like I just think that you could look at your net worth, understand what you need to do, or start researching on what you need to do, and and then financially it could help you get where you need to be so you could be fulfilled in your own life in your own way right like you know you talk to um, you know you talk to someone and they're like oh my god if i had 2 million dollars i would buy a 700 you know 1000 dollar house you talk to a multimillionaire he might say i want to buy a, a studio in dubai right you right like it's all very different but it, again it's like what fulfills you you know, um, could you help people around you, right? All these right. things. But yeah, getting getting to know your net worth is about understanding where you're at and what you need to do to get to your goals. I love it. I love yeah. it. So, you know, I, I want to unpack a few things. You know, mm -hmm. our podcast is called Raw Success. Yes. So we are, we are about informing people of how to be successful on different genres and different ways to get there. But also speaking about the mindset. Yeah. You know, the mindset of a success. So tell us a little bit about the, your upbringing and, and how you got to become yes. this, you know, this, this invent, this not, not inventor, but, um, you know, who you are today. Yeah. yeah Someone yeah. who can turn an idea into something <laughs> that's worth 75 million. <laughs> yeah. wow. uh, um, I think, I think, you know, it's funny with that. Like we ended up doing uh, an application for um, uh, a startup accelerator and they said, you know, Tell us something about you, like just mm -hmm. thing. And I said, if there was a war, mm. I am definitely the commander you want leading your country. I love that. Right? And that could tell you everything. Why? That will tell you I'm a leader I do not follow. Mm. Right? And, mm. you know, we grew up, you know, again, the inner city, like yeah, you're, you're my parents. Brooklyn, right? Yeah. Originally, I was born in Brooklyn. I lived in Jersey. I lived in Massachusetts. Um, you know, but the biggest thing is like, I just felt like, you know, my parents split up at an early age and I got to see um, I got to see two incredible parts that most humans don't get to experience until later in life. Mm. And I'm talking about the up and down. I, I grew up very fortunate uh, in incredible Disney. I, I want to call it like Disney movie type of lifestyle, meaning that you're you're 
your father does very well. You know, you had a maid in the house. We had a house, right? A housekeeper, all that. And we had a resort in Dominican Republic. Uh, very, very comforting. Definitely not like lower class. Mm-hmm. I, I would say very upper middle class. Yeah. And um, my parents got divorced and I went from a home to my parents being split up to living in a one bedroom and I was in a closet. Wow. Right. Big change. And then my mom couldn't afford after the divorce, my mom couldn't afford the apartment. So what she did was she shipped me to uh, my grandmother's house who, you know, did she did a, an amazing job welcoming, but my grandma didn't have space. So I went from like a house to like my mom getting divorced, having a one bedroom apartment. I'm sleeping in a closet. And then, um, and then I get transferred to Boston to, to Massachusetts, sorry, to Lawrence, Massachusetts. And, and there I'm like sleeping on a floor. Wow. Well, how do you run it? Huh? I, I think like 12. Okay. Right. So what did I learn? Like real quick there, it was number one, I will never sleep on a motherfucking floor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Number two, uh, my son will never sleep on a mm-hmm. fucking floor. <laughs> wow. Right? Wow. Like, like, uh, and um, and then I understood, like, oh, okay, all this like money and um and what people think is success, mm-hmm. it, it was it's like fraudulent because it's like if you told me my happiest moments were my dad and mom. And then, like, if you're like, oh, was it the vacation? Was it this? Was it that? Was it? And it's like, no, nah, it, it, it wasn't that. Listen, I'm all for, like, you know, we should live a comfortable life. I love beautiful things, right? But I learned these things don't value a good life, mm. right? Early, early on, right? Mm. And then I also understood I got to experience the best of the best Mm -hmm. and the worst of the worst. Mm. So then I was like, oh, okay, I know which one I want. Wow. And that really set me in many different ways. Like my father, um, he had a bar, but he was never, never drunk in front of me. So I never drank. My dad never said, don't drink. I just never drank. I never cared for it. Mm. Right. My dad would wear his bell and my pants would never like mm-hmm. be down. It was like, you know, so it, it was just like I, I, I got some great things from my father, mm. uh, who's an incredible father. Um, mm-hmm. But again, my process was just like really like stepping back and saying what's success, what's not success. And then like understanding why I never want to live like this. So I need to do other things. Right. Wow. So so when people were like, you know, my peers were like, Hey, I I want to go clubbing. I was always thinking, well, what business could I build and wow. how could I scale wow. and how could I do this? And then like at an early age, it, you, you know, this is right. Like I'm a big hip hop head. Like, nice. um, but it's like, you know, it's, it, these were my my heroes. My heroes is like Nas, uh, Jay. Nice. Uh, then it's like Steve Jobs. Warren Buffett thing. My brother-in-law, I remember he, he's like older than me, six, seven years older. Uh, and he was like, he walked one day into my house and I was like, yeah, you know, Sam Warren runs Walmart. And he's like, who the fuck is Sam Warren? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like reading Wall Street journals wow. and, and like and, and like paying attention to like um, Berkshire Hathaway stock. And I, then I started buying stocks. And then it was like, you know, and obviously some folks have helped, but it's like, um, you know, that switch goes on where you're like, oh, the way money works is that money's supposed to work. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people think I work for money. Mm-hmm. No, no. Money is supposed to work by itself. Mm-hmm. Right. And and that's what I always try to tell people is like, look at your goals. Don't save up for your goals. Invest and use the gains for whatever you want. And again, mm-hmm. not picking, you know, whatever is important to you, whether it's a vacation, a car you know, or anything like that. It's just, you don't have to like earn your way there because what happens is the people that are doing that are typically the people that are retiring around 70 sign. They have probably money saved up for, you know, maybe five or six years for retirement. Mm -hmm. Like you're betting that you're going to live 80 sign years old. I'm betting that I'm dead in four years. Mm, And and that's how you're playing the game. My biggest fear is time. Uh, Explain. Uh, um, I don't sit for shit. 
Okay. If you could accomplish whatever you can today, do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm not like big on, um, oh, this is my routine and all this is like, I don't care about your routine. I care about what you did, mm -hmm. what you executed. Then you do whatever the hell you want. Mm -hmm. But like focus on what the goal is to advance you and then, and then, you know, folk, you know, do other stuff that you like. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's how I view it. It's like, uh, you know, not saying like, Hey, I have a death clock in four years, but I don't have this thing of like, I have 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have that. I, I feel like, like right now I'm moving to San Francisco. Um, definitely moving our headquarters over there as well. Right. Um, and you know, I look at it like this is what we got to do over the next 24 months. Next 48 months, this is where we're going to be. When we hit X, Y, Z, this is what I'm going to do in my personal life. This is what I'm going to share with my family, my friends. This is what I, like, I have things mapped out in a way of like, once this happens, this triggers this. Once right. this, and the only way to do that is if you're like stepping back and saying, okay, what really makes me happy? What fulfills me? And what are my financial goals to get there? So, so you seem very self-aware. A hundred percent. How did you develop that self-awareness? You know, you, you have people that say, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know why I'm here. But you seem very self-aware and, and, and yeah, confident. Yeah, I'm here to help millions of people have a better life, mm. right? And, it, right, somebody could say, oh, but in what way, right? Like, listen, some people, you know, buy food for others for, for they could do better. I want to um, I wanna do incredible philanthropy work for the inner city kids. I want to continue to build the best social DeFi app that helps millions of users from third world countries to first world countries uh, invest in crypto, right? And create an incredible community around our brand and product. Um, you know, that's, so I, I think I think it's true if somebody's like, hey, I'm a little lost, like I, I don't know, you know, what I should do. I think you just play around with things, learn, learn more about yourself, um, you know, because for me, like, that's that. The other thing is I don't have a, I don't have a fucking ego. Mm. So I don't give two shits about like, I could read on something for six fucking hours and I could say, okay, this, this is, this is how it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. And if you could show me in two minutes that there's an easier path or a better one, we're switching plans in two minutes. Yeah. That's what makes, uh, uh, you know, very big for the audience to understand. There's a very big difference between a businessman and a founder. Mm -hmm. We grow. We're our expectation of growth. And you're both. Yeah. Right. But but the founder is a it's a different animal mm -hmm. because all we care about is how to grow. Now, I, I, I and, and by the way, I'm not pushing like anything like grow and, you know, with fraudulent numbers or dumb shit like that. I mean, grow. And this ego or hierarchy of how business is supposed to be done gets thrown the fuck out the window, mm. right? So self-aware is I'm very good at understanding. Uh, I have a good understanding of what I'm not good at. Mm. I have a profound understanding of what I'm great at. Hmm. Uh, so so would you say is is that what people should focus on? Yeah, I mean, I meet people all the time and and like they're very like, I mean, some people are just like hesitant because they're, they, you know, they, they've they never like either invested or anything like that. But in general, for people that are thinking about like, hey, business or this or that, it's like, tell me what you want to do. How big do you want to do it? And stop caring about your personal ideas. Right. And and for me, I feel like that's where most people lose in life. Mm. Um, they can't grow when you're just stuck on your own traditional ideas of mm. things, right? And and that's why, like, you know, obviously, like, a little off the... I'm very... I'm a very progressive person, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And some things, I'm conservative. Mm -hmm. And some things, I'm very liberal, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. It's, so it's a mixture of my own views and what I'm constantly right. learning. Yeah, D definitely. And, and I see that. Like, if, if I was to describe you, I would definitely say an outside-the-box thinker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. I remember you even telling me, like, true, stop reading so many books. <laughs> like, and, and basically what you meant, not that books are issues, but, like, yeah. get to work. Get going. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I, 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 I mean, I think Gary Vee has said it. He's like, uh, um, how many fucking books do you need to read before you start doing something? Word. Right? Where, where actually the guy that's like, 
hey, I read half the book, but I like I already put in like 10 hours of work on this. He's already way more advanced than the guy that's saying. And, and by the way, I, I think books are, again, going back to incredible. But again, get do the things that you need to do to get you, you know, in the position that you want to be. Experience is the best teacher. 100%. I mean, look at this. I think I just read, uh, I think, 50 or 60% of like top of the top 500 companies are removing like college education needed, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have, I mean, if you look at like Silicon Valley, where, where I'm heading to, mm -hmm. um, a bunch of dropouts. They, wow. they, this is who the top companies hire, mm. right? So it's, yeah, so it's like, it's <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it's totally different. I think the world is, it's just changed. It's just very yeah. different. It's just very different. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, when we started, I wanted to bounce around a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, 15 years of ex of experience of scaling businesses. Yeah, right? yeah. And I, I know that you were once an owner of a Harley Davidson store. A motorcycle store. Motorcycle yeah, store. Yeah, yeah. The, the store yeah. was called Motocanic, and we sold, uh, sold high-end apparel uh, mostly for, like, Italian European motorcycles, so more closer yeah. to Ducati yeah. than like Harley, but but Harley was uh we sold some products for them too. But yeah, it was like an upscale boutique. This is my early twenties. Um and so, yo, that is that's just I want y'all to process that. Think about the uh, a twenty year old that you know now and think about him in his early twenties owning a motorcycle business. Yeah, yeah, business. Yeah, <laughs> correct, correct. So we had an e-commerce, we had an online store and a retail store. And I was actually the the co-founder there. His name is Ivan. He's one of the co-founders of Motocanic. Uh, oh, sorry, of um, Nettyworth. Nice. So, so again, same, same team. yeah, same team, uh, same group of guys. And um, yeah, you know, I had this idea of like, hey, you know, let's sell, sell some, you know, high-end helmets and apparel. Um, it was very interesting. It was my university. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a quick thing. Like we got to like a million dollars in sales in like 24 months. Wow. Right. Now with that, mm -hmm. <laughs> with that, uh -oh. um, our margins was about 25%. Right. So if you say, if you say you're selling a million, you got a 25% margin, you're left with 250,000, uh, which is a quarter of a mil, 250,000 minus, um, like shipping returns, employees, rent for the shop, uh, and then you break down the salaries and then the ownership. And then you were you were talking about thirty seven thousand dollars a piece. Like That's you know, and, and I was very honest. Like I I was like, oh, this is shit. These yeah. margins are shit. But it, it I learned a lot. I learned a lot about uh branding, uh, you know, uh pricing policies, um, you know, um I, I, I'll, I'll say this. This is something that um, I, I always tell people that are close to me. Sometimes I hear people say, I don't care about politics. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. So our retail business was doing about 50, 60,000 a month just in the retail store, mm -hmm. right? Which is not millions of dollars or anything like that. And our number one customer were from Brazil. And Brazil was facing at the time, um, they were they were probably responsible for about 40,000 of that. Mm, and wow. at the time, their country was like changing, I think, presidency or something was going on there. And I wasn't paying attention mm. to, right, the, the Brazilian the market. Right. And our fucking sales plummet. Wow. Right? Because their currency is dropping, you know, all these things. And that's where I started learning Oh, if I was aware of what was going on there, yeah. I could have been a little bit more conservative on what I should have had in the store. So it would have made it a lot easier for, you know, finances right. and all that. But I'm just giving a little drop in the bucket of that. A million, um, doing a million dollars in business doesn't mean that you're making a million dollars. Right. Okay. The second thing is, uh, and, and when I say like, don't be in, like, you should, uh, understand what's going on in politics. I'm not saying that you should be affiliated with any party. I'm saying you should just be aware what's right, going on. Right. Keep, right. Keep on the yeah. Place. Because right. something that small impacted a retail store in New Jersey. Wow. Like, you know, like something in, in this part of the world impacted that. So I, I, I would just say that I think, um, so yeah, I built, I ended up building that 
we we were running a database for like Amazon for for the motorcycle industry that was selling products on like Amazon and getting products to be uploaded faster for um uh for like motorcycle dealers and we ended up uh selling that portion to Motorcycle Mall mm -hmm. right we we gave them like a licensing uh deal where they had access uh to that for about five years and that's how we uh basically closed off the business mm -hmm. in a way where it was clean right mm -hmm. like like meaning we, we paid off what we needed and then um uh motorcycle mall ended up uh doing the licensing deal for for that and to this day if you go to their website it was like our original design yeah <laughs> and you know i um i remember when you were telling me about that store yeah and you mentioned something about cleaning toilets and now here you go, yeah. Make make bringing in a million dollars worth of revenue, and the owner, yeah. And still you clean toilets, and how how most people now I don't want to say most people I don't want to generalize how some people are not willing to put that type of work in. They just see like the you know the, the oh I'm a business owner they're entitled, but they don't even see like you were cleaning toilets. Yeah, yeah. So so I was cleaning the toilet of my store, right? Uh, right, 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 right. Right. Yeah. right. So like yeah, like um. I, it wasn't like uh, I don't always pretty like I, 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 dirty. yeah you gotta you know you gotta do things that you know that's why I say a uh, uh, a business person or an owner is not a founder right and I think I already had the DNA of a founder and a founder does whatever it takes mm. right uh, t you know to get things done so if you have a beautiful showroom and the person that's coming in is you know calls out. That means you do everything. You make the coffee. You, 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 you know, you help someone out. You know, one of the things that I would, o like, I would always say is like, you, you know, you talk about again, like ego, mm -hmm. I would help so many customers that had no idea I was the owner of the business. Wow. Right. And I would always say, oh, well, that's their policy. Right. And, and, um, and, and it's just that because it's like thinking, okay, wh what's the best thing for the business? And all that stuff. I think again, if you drop away ego, you do whatever it takes to get things done. So now, with, with your 15 years of scaling businesses, why why NFTs? Why technology now? Why the focus on that? Yeah. So so I would say about three years ago, um, again, I was a marketing director for a fintech company, and it was pretty interesting. That so she ended up selling, like let's just call it like a book of business. And she ended up getting a few million dollars and I was her like top guy mm -hmm. in the company. Right. Mm -hmm. And do you know what was my bonus? Mm. Zero. Mm -hmm. Do you know what was <laughs> my extra? So I said, and by the way, I don't feel like she needed to give me that. I just think like, um, you, you now again, a, a business person or a founder, a founder would say, Hey, I am going to gather uh, an incredible group of talented people that are going to grow this business beyond my years. Mm -hmm. That's what a founder does. Mm -hmm. A business owner says, how do I keep the most money in my pocket? Mm -hmm. They're very, very different and yes, uh, different yes, goals. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, so uh, during that time, um, I was introduced to NFTs, which is digital art. Um, and I was fucking hooked. And, wow. and I saw the future um, you know, very vividly of like what's about to happen. Mm. And, you know, I collected baseball cards when I was younger. Um, so I, I, I started getting the idea really quick and I, I think, uh, about, yeah, like two and a half years ago, I grabbed everything I had in, in the financial market, which is the stock market. And I started buying crypto and digital art. Um, um, and I, and I quickly realized like, a lot of people just didn't know they're they're saying oh what they think nfts is like a picture nft is a is is a technology it's a non-fungible token it's a token that can never be replaced you can never replicate it you can never do anything like that so why is that important why because artists who who've been selling art for hundreds of years now creates a piece of art mm -hmm. that they get royalties for life now, what does that mean? If 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 Picasso sold your his art to to you for five hundred dollars, and then you know thirty years later that sells for a million dollars, Picasso doesn't get a dollar. In the NFT world, Picasso makes money 
off of every transaction. Now, why would a traditional artist ever go back to traditional art? It's not happening. That's it. The future is there. Actually, my favorite piece of art is by Art Blocks. It's called The Singularity. My favorite piece of art. I, by the way, I, I don't own it, so I'm not pumping my bag. I'm going to buy it. Nah. Um, it's, it's like three grand or so. But it, you know, for people that don't know, The Singularity is a moment of time in which something occurs that can never be reverted back. And it's literally what crypto is. You cannot take it away. This is why uh, BlackRock, uh, you know, pushed the ETF. Why now the SEC is all on board. This technology is undeniable. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as AI. Mm -hmm. AI has a singularity effect, meaning the minute that people were using open AI, mm -hmm. the world said we are never going back. Right, right. And, and that's what it is. Wow. Wow. And, Powerful. And um, when, when you said here that your app allows you to manage, where well, it says allow users to chat, manage, and borrow against digital and real world assets. Yes, yes. Can you explain that? W yeah. What does that mean in layman terms? Yeah. So, all right. So, let's go back into like the first thing chat, right? The app allows you to chat, like, think of it like, like uh, text uh, yeah, like a, like a channel. Think of it like, like Discord, Discord right? or something okay. like that. Manage, it allows you to connect your wallet. And in seconds, get the total value of your uh, of your NFTs and uh, cryptocurrency, mm. right? So uh, what happens is in the digital world, people have uh, you know hundreds of NFTs, and it's hard to keep track of like what's what, what's that. When you connect your wallet to Net Worth, immediately you're going to get your NFT and your crypto value, which totals to your net worth, Net Worth, mm. right? So that's that. And then the borrow against the digital and real world assets. This is what's coming in the next few months. And this is what it is. If I own a digital art that costs $100,000, I could list it on the NetiWorth platform and borrow against that. Now, that means that you could give me a $20,000 loan for it, right? Mm -hmm. And how does it work? It helps me get access to capital without needing Social Security or banks. It helps you now become almost like a bank where you're making money off of interest. It interest. So it helps both parties without needing a centralized finance uh, thing, which, which is again, uh, this now. is the whole thing about cryptocurrency mm -hmm. that in many cases, what it's going to do is it's going to remove the power and the control that the traditional banks have mm -hmm. because now you can make money off of the interest, but I could also make money off the loan that you're giving me. Now in the scenario that I don't pay you back, uh, the NFT will be on a smart contract, which is on the blockchain for the folks that are like, hey, this is super technical. It means that it, on collateral, we're not holding the asset. You're not. No one's holding it. But but the system knows the technology knows That's the blockchain, the, the blockchain. blockchain. Once this loan is not paid, it goes to the to the lender. Right. So if I have a hundred thousand uh, dollar digital piece of art, you loan me 20 K. And I don't pay you back. What do you get? Right. You no, get a hundred thousand yeah, dollar piece of art for twenty k. Right. Pretty good, right? right. It, and also, if I pay you back the loan, you made some money, and I probably use that to go do other things. And, you know. And, and, and so, and, and forgive me if these questions are yeah. simple. Who's who's controlling the blockchain? Is this like a neutral party? No, no. Why so, so work? the blockchain is all like again, it's not controlled by anyone. That's. Mm. That's the beautiful part of it. So it all, all the blockchain is, is a digital ledger. Uh, That's it. That ledger says this went to him, right? He did not pay back. He gets this. He paid back. This gets, it's a digital ledger that everyone in the world could see. You uh, can't hide from it. You know, one of the big things where like people said, oh, you know, crypto so dangerous, you know, because, because people, you know, people don't know who, who is who. Actually, the more regulated it becomes and people understand the blockchain, everything is public. Mm. You can't hide. Right, right. Everything is public. I don't know who's who in, in the bank. For the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that's that, you know. Uh, and, and, and so why? And for the real world assets real quick, mm -hmm. what's going to happen is, uh, let's say someone's like, hey, I own this luggage by Supreme and it's super rare. That luggage will be shipped out to one of our partners It'll be authenticated. Mm. And then what the what the owner is going to receive is a token. And now that token, they could borrow against it or they could sell it. 
Nice. Yeah. Nice. How, well, so this, I'm, I'm probably projecting. Yeah. So how, why, how do I say, when you first found out about the NFTs and the crypto. Yeah. So for me, what I experienced was fear. Yeah. You know, why, like, how were you so confident in the system, so to speak? Like, what, what like, I, I want to know what's in you that, that you see this is the future opposed, this is a scam or yeah. this is not going to last or this is a fad. Why were you on the other side? Like, this is the future. I think, okay, all right. So, so, so ego will say, oh, because I knew better, <laughs> right? But, but it's not ego. It's uh, Satoshi's uh, letter, uh, Bitcoin letter. And it was basically how there was no one that was going to have control of this currency, not a government, no one. People could not take it from you. They can't remove it from you. You own the keys, which means you really own this now. Right. Like unlike anything else, you own it. No one could take it from you. Right. Mm -hmm. Like somebody can not come in and say, oh, he, you know, we're taking over this country and we're going to take all your monetary gains. Right. Like so just understanding that and how secure the systems have been uh, specifically with Bitcoin. I think I think it was like, all right, we got something here. Mm. And then and then to understand Oh, will an artist ever produce, even if they produce a physical piece of art, they're going to tie it to the NFT. Will an artist ever create art the way they used to? Mm. That makes no sense, right. right? Like, why would you create something that your kids, kids, kids don't benefit from mm. or that you don't benefit from? Right. So you sell a painting for $1,000, the next guy sells it for a million, and all you got was the 1000 and that's your value as an artist. Right. So I knew this was the beginning of a lot of things changing. Art, uh, music, production, yes. ownership, monetary, right? Uh, currency. Right. We live in America where everything is beautiful and the dollar holds its value to the most part, right? right. Even though it's devaluing every day. 100,000 30 years ago is not 100,000 today. Right. But how about people that live in Argentina that got paid $600 and within 48 hours they're the what they had in the bank dropped to 400. Right. Now, now crypto becomes oh oh pay us in crypto now. Mm -hmm. But hold on, I thought the monetary was legit. I thought it doesn't right. move. Right. And then you start realizing that for third world countries for art, for things for a new way of contracts, for a new way of payment, for a new way of revenue, crypto is going to disrupt the entire financial system. So my so my question with that, because even in looking at you know the cryptocurrencies, they fluctuate so drastically. Yeah, yeah. So should the average consumer be concerned? Because as I'm listening to you, I'm getting excited. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go and yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get on with Net Net Worth <laughs> and, right. and just get everything going. But you know, just. I guess it may be the lack of knowledge and the fact that it's no so so crypto it does uh -huh. fluctuate so no one's debating that yeah I think I think um I think over time yes. that that piece is going to be resolved resolved right. yeah because as the market becomes more stable mm -hmm. and and bigger mm -hmm. uh thing like for instance like uh you can look at crypto today and you're like oh it's down or up mm -hmm. five or ten points. Yeah. That's wild in like the 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 dollar side of yeah, things, right? 100%. Like you can't have a, a business say, "Oh, we, uh, we lost three hundred thousand because crypto went down," right? But I yeah. think I think when you're looking at like what you're supposed to do, so just to make it clear, you're supposed to, and this is my view, this is Michael Michael's right. view from Michael uh micro, micro strategy. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to buy Bitcoin and never sell it, mm -hmm. never never sell it. Do you know why? Because you should borrow against it. Why? Because you can never, you'll never pay taxes on a loan. <laughs> right? And why are you selling an asset that continues to go up? A few months ago, Bitcoin was 17000 Today is 45000 Wow. Why are you selling an asset? Even when Bitcoin at the height was at 62. Mm -hmm. Still, hold the asset. Hold the asset. Right. Borrow against it if you need it. But you should not be selling Bitcoin specifically. Other assets like Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, I think those are tradable and they have value, like their network has value. 
Um, you know, Visa just had a partnership with Solana, I believe. Um, you know, Ethereum is, you know, extremely used in the NFT as a as a as a case study of how people are using that. You know, so I, I think um who's another guy? The guy from Shark Tank, what's his name? Um uh Mark Cuban. Not not Mark Cuban. He he's always wearing a uh a, a, a suit, a black suit. What's his name? I know you talk about the ball head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So <laughs> you, you know, he always says he's like, look at crypto as software. That's it. It's software that makes money move. In one of your tweets, you said we might have experienced the bottom. The next bull run will be crazy. Can you explain? Yeah, crazy and why? All right. So what happens is because the the market has been legitimized. The SEC is now you know just approved an ETF. That means that people's whether it's pension or four hundred one k, they're going to be able to invest in Bitcoin. Mm. That that wasn't. We never accounted for that, wow. but wow. this is the thing: they need to buy Bitcoin to sell the to sell that Bitcoin to these people, right? To so, to gather this. Not to cut you, yeah. So while the numbers may be down, there's things happening behind the scenes that are showing that this is the future. And the whoever are whoever's watching this podcast when it airs, stamp the date, and every year look at the price of crypto, and look. Go back to this podcast every year. Just look at it. And you know what? Blast me if I'm if I'm wrong. Every year, look at it. And you're going to be shocked of what we're going to see over the next five years. If you if you just type in JP Morgan Bitcoin price prediction, just do that on your phone. Right. Again, JP Morgan. This is not YouTube. This is not a podcast. I think JP's Morgan price prediction is at one hundred forty six thousand. Mm -hmm. wow. Folks, uh, Bitcoin's at forty four, forty five thousand. Get in now. <laughs> right. Get and, in and, now. and by the way, there's people like Kathy Woods that has Bitcoin going to a million to two million. So you want to talk about generational wealth or what's about to happen? I mean, it, it, it's coming. I, I think we're two to three years away from seeing like a giant run. But I think this is the time that people are accumulating and buying. I mean, I've, I haven't stopped buying. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I keep telling people, stop looking at the price. Focus more on how many you're buying. Don't focus on that Solana's $93. Focus on how many Solanas you want to have. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on Ethereum being at 2400 mm -hmm. Say, I want to have 25 50 what, what, Ethereum. What's the difference in the mindset there? Um, I think because you're you're looking at long term, right? Uh, so long term, I don't, I, I don't care that Solana could be at 110 Who cares? I don't give two shits about that. Mm -hmm. Tell me that Solana could be at 800 to to $1,000 and I bought hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. You know, like that, the, it, it's, it's the game of like, Hey, what we're going to do over the next few years to, so as I'm listening to you and being in real estate myself, I see a lot of similarities and parallels because it's as if, if I'm working with a client, they're like, Oh, pricing is high. Yeah. Relative to what? Cause I have clients who purchased two years ago and said the same thing, but now they have an asset that's fifty, sixty thousand dollars more yeah. because pricing has been shooting up the last few weeks. So it's interesting that you say I see there's yeah. so many parallels. Yeah, I think that. I think again, I think this is my view of a home. You buy a home for the memories and the love that you're gonna have in that home. I don't view any home as an investment. Mm. Any home. Mm. Right? I view it as oh, maybe it's an internal investment, like what it does for you. My family needs more space, so I want a home. Right. Or or I want to customize my home. Or uh leave it. Right. Or 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 leave it. Yeah. Like, but for me, e nice. even for me, I, I don't want to leave my son a house. Mm. Which is wild, right? Because people right. would be like, What do you mean you don't want to leave your son I a house? I told you he was a think <laughs> outside the box thinker. Right? Because my son might be like, I don't want to live in this fucking town. Right. Yeah, Which yeah. then he's going to sell or thing. I think this, I think, uh, cre you know, I think properties, if you're creating a, a home with love and memories, maybe you want even your parents to be there. I think, I think a home like could provide you so much value of like love and all this stuff way beyond that $50,000 gain or something like that. Mm. I think if you're playing the game of money, why do I need to leverage myself at 500, 600,000 to make 40,000? You know, just listening to you. I'd rather invest a quarter of a million in a business 
than 500,000, 600,000 in a house. You know what I appreciate about you is if you're really listening, you speak about money and, and like I know you, you like nice things. Just so that you know, this is the first man that I've ever known. Now, when I went to his house, he had a damn motorcycle in his living room. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and it's like normal. It's like, yo, bro, you got a motorcycle in your living room? Like, like this is crazy. I love but, art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. Art. <laughs> so definitely like on another level. But but I you well, what I appreciate, you always talk about love, friendship, yeah, generosity. Yeah. So you, you you're very well balanced. You know, a lot of people, they either like, they're all about love, friendship, enjoying life. Or money, money, broke. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or money, 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 <laughs> yeah, money, yeah. money. Yeah, yeah. And you, you seem to like dance between these two worlds. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it's, um, I think it's, again, going back to that childhood thing of like knowing what's real, right? Like, uh, yeah, spending time with my father, there's no value to that. Like, wow. you know, I would empty a bowl to be with him. Right. And my dad is still alive. Like that, that it's just beautiful. Right. To be able to like talk to him or things like that. So like, you know, I don't have children, you know, but I, I feel like my nephews are a very big part of my life. You know, I, I Isaiah, you know, if he's watching this, like he's my nephew. I pick up every time he calls. Right. And by the way, I'm not like, I'm not a billionaire. Right. I'm not like this multi-millionaire guy, right? Unless you're like, oh, I'm tying his value to the business. Then you're like, all right, there's money there. But like, I just feel like the the dollar is never going to change me, whether I'm at $5 million or or a billion dollars, right? Like, mm -hmm. I know that like, even when I get to certain levels of the bag, mm -hmm. guess the first things I say, mm -hmm. oh, I can't wait to buy this for this person. I never said me because uh, in a lot of ways I've like, I've, I've been a kid, right? I'm 37 years old. And I've also like, I, you know, like my birthday's coming up. There's not anything that I like want, mm -hmm. you know, maybe like a good dinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Right. So, but in my, in my late twenties, oh man, I wanted watches, cars, motorcycles yeah. and all that. But that, that fades pretty quick. You get tired of shit and all that. So, you know, Again, right, we're unpacking different topics here. Two things I, I, I want to ask you. You know, I have a son that's 18 years old. Yeah. What? I don't want, I don't want to say it, it's advice. To serve. I'll use advice for lack of a better word. What advice would you give young men in their 20s, right? And the second thing is I've, I've heard you reference your father multiple times. Yeah. So obviously uh, your father played a major role in your life. Super. And, and nowadays in, in, in service communities, it seems like there's an epidemic of the lack of fathers in the household, right? So can you speak to that? To those yeah, so, so as far as for like that 18, 20 year old, is it like financial advice or like life advice? Life advice. Okay. Both. Both. Okay, okay, all right. So if financially, the first thing I would do is, is I would start developing <laughs> which means is I would start learning how to code to be more independent and to have a career where you're going to be around for the next 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Um, I also would, if you're considering education, I would do local education over like that giant university or that cool place to go to campus. Um, so I, I, I would do that. Like if, you, if you're in the route of like school, do community college, learn how to code or other skill sets that drive you in the modern world, such as like uh, graphics, uh, coding, or even management, like product management. I think a lot of those things, um, there's more like certificates that could take care of the need of like a degree. Mm -hmm. um, and then like for life, I would just say, I'm not, I'm, you know, because I spent a lot of my twenties working like for myself and, and also having like jobs, um, I would say start like now, like whatever you want to do, do it now. And you don't have 10 years. You don't have 15 years. You, you're not behind, but just start now. And you're going to learn so much more. I think this whole narrative of like, I want to hang out, chill and play like video games. I think that's like a waste of life. And now what would you say to a, a man is in his mid forties, like myself, who is not really in tune with the future or, or, 
I, I, I would say the same shit. You're not, you're not late, but you need to start now. And what that means is I, you need to put yourself, uh, anyone in, in that point is I, they need to put themselves in the best position that the market demands the highest value for them. Mm. Not what they're, you know, like, and again, I think, a, you know, you have people that are editing videos that are making six figures. You have people that are graphic designers that are making six figures. You have people, um, you know, that are developers making three, 400,000. You could develop in the next two to three years. Like it's a very straight path. It's just most people don't want to learn something new because it's out of their scope. But yeah, I would say that it's just like put yourself in a position that the market gives you the most value. Why is Steve Jobs your biggest inspiration? So Steve Jobs was adopted. Um, my father raised me. My father's not my bio, my biological father. Um, and um, I think Steve, Johnny Ive, and the whole Apple brand, it was like the first thing I fell in love with as a young kid. And, and I felt like I was fucking completely misunderstood. I felt like a fucking, like, again, like people would like, they like they knew something, but it was like it was still weird. Like I could look at an item for hours. Mm -hmm. And and then I have this incredible thing of like, you know, I'm like, oh, but what what were they thinking when they did this? And mm -hmm. and whose thought was this? And <laughs> how can you imagine being in the room when this happened? <laughs> right. And I go through that. And then it's like, here's these pioneers. Right. Let's talk about Steve Jobs who revolutionized computers, technology, mm -hmm. the phone, the, the world that we live in, uh, had incredible flaws as a, as a man. Mm. So I was also able to say, oh, that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. So I learned so much from him. I felt attached because of his, um, his story of being adopted. I felt uh, attached because he felt like a misfit in his own way. Mm. And I felt like the same in my world. Mm. So I was like the kid that is like, oh, I love Coogee sweaters. And I also love design mm -hmm. and art. And then I would like look at things and be like, this is so ugly. How could you just look at this? How dare this be in my presence? Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and think, I mean, like, yeah. check this out. Like I'm moving. And uh, my girlfriend's like, Wow, like J July is very intentional. My forks in my house right. are from Mark Newson. Like, <laughs> like my forks. I have to yeah. love my forks. So what that does is everything I do, I give a fuck, right? Mm -hmm. What there was this one guy that he he was working for us, and he said July has a high give a fuck value, yeah. right? And that means yeah. his fork. That means his plate. That means right. my toaster. Yeah. That means my clothes, right? right? Right. So sometimes guys will be like, uh, um, oh, I don't like shopping for clothes or whatever. And I, and I get it or whatever. But like, have you have you worn a two thousand dollar suit? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I had this funny post and I said, um, I said, uh, some uh, everyone, uh, some superheroes wear a suit. Others were Calvin Klein, <laughs> right? And and, and 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 Calvin Klein, by the way, it's like like a great brand. Like you could get like a nice suit for three five hundred bucks. And at the time, that was my big deal. And I love Calvin Klein. Yeah. But like, it, look up Zenya. Look up what a three four thousand dollars suit is, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. So I I always say that, right? Every superhero needs a suit. And at that time, that was Calvin Klein for me or whatever. But right. like, level up in your in your thoughts and i think i have this thing that's very different i don't value materialistic things because i think it makes me better than someone i i don't care about that mm -hmm. most watch brands my favorite watch brand is called alang and son that's a german brand 99 percent of the world will not will not even know about it, Never heard of it. all right the watch is anywhere between 30 to sixty thousand mm -hmm. dollars right love it and i don't care who doesn't know about it? Mm. I know about it, right? Mm. So I say this. There are people that like material or products to make themselves feel better or to validate them versus others. Mm -hmm. And then there's 
another group of people that celebrate human excellence. Mm. And for me, when I look at a knife, when I look at a utensil, when I look at a suit, when I look at a product, give me the passion. Tell me that someone did something. Uh, Alan Edmonds, uh, an American brand, uh, the shoes were used in World War II. Uh, one of my favorite shoes, they're not the most expensive. They're probably like anywhere between two to 400 bucks. Mm -hmm. They're shoes that are 3,000, 4,000. I love their story. I love their the family business. I love their history of yeah. what they did. When I wear them, I celebrate human excellence, wow. right? And, and if human excellence um, is not celebrated, then we're dismissing that. Right. So so if I love art, why shouldn't I love someone hand stitching a shoe? Right. Right. So it's all tied together. Same thing of like, you know, I sometimes I eat crappy food. Right. And sometimes I eat really good food and and it doesn't have to be exquisite, you know, crazy meals. Mm -hmm. But you could go to this mom and pop shop. That's a, a great price made with love. And you're like, wow, it's my favorite meal. Yeah. You, you know, it's interesting that we're talking about this because I was just having a conversation with a friend about how I noticed that things have became so bland. Like it's just about creating something, but the intention to make it unique or make it stand out or or the excellence, yeah. th that that seems to be to to have be getting lost where though where tell me where and i and i'll help you see it where? i appreciate that tell me again, get, any let's idea. start with, with, with something simple right fashion i think i think i think it depends what type of fashion but i think that um you know if you look at, again it depends what type of fashion that you're looking at but like hermes for and this is on the women's side I mean, if you just look at the process of what it takes, first of all, the brand is probably the most powerful brand in the world mm. outside of Apple. Hermes is not fake luxury. It's pure luxury, which means it's handcrafted, high value. They don't pay one celebrity to wear it. Mm. You wear it because you paid for it. Mm. For me, that's that's pure luxury. And what's fake luxury? Um, Marketing. Where and, and I'm a marketer. Where 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 this is being endorsed and promoted by someone as something that's good, but the but the quality doesn't meet the expectation of the brand. I, I think that I think again. I don't own anything from Hermes. I don't shop at Hermes. I'm not their demographic. Um, even though some men buy their product, but their quality, their story, their history. Right. Their 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 strong, you know, desire of like, hey, we don't do things like other people that, you know, that's that's his own thing. Again, there's great brands outside. I got another one for you. Mm. Music. We have a reggaeton artist in the building, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. So me, I think music, people need to understand it's constantly evolving and artists. OK, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh sometimes one of your favorite artists comes out with a project that you don't really like. But the difference between an artist and a product is a product is consistent. An artist, you have an expectation, but that artist could change as a human, right? But a pro like, you know, when you buy something from Apple, you get high quality, great product, great service. Right. An artist is doing that, but could change to what degree or what dynamic for your own thing. It's because you're expecting the same thing when it's a it's a human. It's 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 evolving. It it cannot be the same. You That's, remind me of Andre 3000 when you say that because he just put out that. Yeah, that like uh, <laughs> oh okay. So he changed so, completely 180 from where you like was that a a big fan of the flu album? Uh no. But, but it, I don't I can't discredit him. Yeah. You know, like right. like and all that, like I just think I think with music is is thing like uh, I think Bad Bunny is one of the greatest artists of the last decade, not because of his numbers. I think he brought um, I think he took a genre of music, interpreted it in a an American style trap way where he changed the rhythm because their their rhythm was so like 
repetitive where it was like, oh, now I don't know if this beat is from The Weeknd or from Bad Bunny. <laughs> right? right? And I think, I think you need sometimes people like that to pioneer change. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Post Malone's incredible. I think, uh, I, I think there, I think like, you know, in a weird way, I think artists today are much more diverse, mm-hmm. have multiple layers mm-hmm. that an artist from like 20 years ago mm-hmm. doesn't have that. And, and, and I think a lot of times people forget that what made, let's talk about hip hop, what made Pac, what made Biggie so great mm-hmm. is how diverse they were. <laughs> diverse, diverse in a way that Biggie could do a song Right, like Juicy could do a song like Ten Crack Commandments and could do a song Who Shot You. Yeah, Who Shot You yeah. and do a song with Bone Thugs and Harmony. Oh. If Biggie was alive, he would be doing records with Migos. With, wow. you know, right, right. definitely right. with Quavo. Right. And that's what I mean. Like s- sometimes we look back and we're like, oh, but they're not like thing. And we're like, no, no, those are you said Andre three thousand. During that time, do you know what people were saying? Oh, he's weird. Oh yeah. Well, oh, he, he's yeah. funky. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's different. it's a little strange. Yeah. He's you're different, right. Right. right? It's it's all that, right? Yeah. Look at look at yeah. Tupac's his his range. His range was incredible. Probably one of the greatest, right? Like he could go from hit him up to dear mama to you know right. Right, right. <laughs> to Cali Love, right? right? Like yeah. Yeah. all that. You know, it's interesting as you talk about music. I can hear and see your mind and how you are just open. Yeah, yeah. And again, you said I don't have an ego. Yeah. So you're just open, and I, I think you're. Well, I check my ego. Everyone has an ego, but, right? Right. But right, it's right, like, right, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Give me for that. And I, and I think that ego does have a place, right? I hundred percent. I yeah. I am very fucking confident. Indeed. And some people Indeed. can look at it like, "Whoa, that's right. a strong ego." But I'm right. I'm so confident right. that I know when I'm wrong. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So yeah. And, and so as, yeah. as you talk about music, I can hear how you view crypto and why. You can accept crypto and see why it's the future. Yeah, yeah. And in just your 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 ability to be a visionary, yep. even the way you described your taste in music. Yes, yeah. In fashion. Um, as we start to like, you know, land a plane, as I like to say. Um, why do you think so? You uh, many investors and critics fail to grasp the concept of NFTs. Yeah, yeah. With crypto and NFTs, and and with that post that I created. I basically said, um, I think I talked about different generations, but I said like, uh, again, I yeah. might have it wrong, but it's like, you know, let's say 60s and 70s, uh, it was like comic book and it was like, oh, there's a joke, you, you know, stop reading it. That's that's for clowns. That's for kids. Right. And then you're like, oh my God, these action figures become production houses that are now owned by Disney, right? So that comic book, that was a, a joke. Ah, is a multi-billion going. dollar industry, right? And and then you you just keep going through this where you're like, um, oh, you know what? That music, that inner city music, turn it down. It's just noise. Mm-hmm. You know what? Mm-hmm. It's just a fad. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes a multi-billion dollar industry and actually still leading the path. Because right. even when they say other music, tell me where that music really comes from, mm-hmm. right? So if you could go through this with sneakers. I mean, I, I remember like, where where a lot of parents would be like, oh, that's a joke, you know, like buying sneakers for your kids that are like this or that, uh, fashion. They like it was almost like the world didn't understand it. Today, the sneakers are a multi billion dollar brand. Right. Gaming, most people don't know this. The gaming industry is bigger than the film industry. Hmm. But I thought video gaming was just for you know, loners and didn't do things or whatever. And by the way, when, when I say, hey, don't waste your time playing video games, if you're out there like streaming, building a fan base and a community around your gaming, go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, but yeah, like uh, I think this is this is the next thing that it's like, oh, it's a fad. Oh, it's just thing. And then you're like, oh, shit, man, the Internet. Oh, that's a fad. I remember even people, oh, social media. I'm not on social media. I don't need to use social media. I'm I don't one need of those people. I don't need validation from other people. I don't right. need validation from the world. Oh, that's yeah. so dumb. The people that spend all their time there, blah, 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 blah. Welcome to the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, like, right. and it, it's all that. People are going, all oh, crypt. I mean, guys, one dollar can't get you a fucking Bitcoin. One dollar mm-hmm. 
the dollar, the U.S. dollar is not pegged to Bitcoin. Wow, think about it. Right? That. So right. a Bitcoin costs forty five, forty seven thousand dollars mm -hmm. A dollar is a dollar. Right. Right? So you tell me mm -hmm. who the world said which one is worth more. Right? right? One Bitcoin or one dollar, right? And, yeah. and, and then somebody could stay saying, oh, I don't know, it's a fad. It's then you really think it's a fad when banks are buying crypto? Right. I mean, they're in gas stations. I, I will say that, you know, and, and I, I'm not just saying this because you're here. One of the mistakes, if somebody want to regret or mistake I've done is thinking everything, you know, as a, as a man in his mid forties, thinking everything's a fad. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's a, know, it's a, knocking it. It's a, it's a, it's a dismissive approach. Yes. So yes. it's, I don't want to acknowledge this. I don't even want to think about how serious this could be. So it's just a fad, right? right. They said that you like one of those people. Like they said that about Tesla. Like oh yeah. Absolutely. Right. So so people are saying, oh, electric cars are yeah. so thing. But Tesla today is worth more than every automaker. Mm. Every automaker. Mm -hmm. They're outselling every automaker. Every automaker is still losing money on the majority of their vehicles, right? Like yeah. uh, uh sorry, uh uh EV vehicles. Yeah. Um it, it, it's a fad until it's not, right. and and I would I would try to stay in the side of being open to things mm -hmm. because the way you win is by acknowledging that something is coming. So the way you the way you won on Instagram, this is going years back. It was by saying, "Oh, this is going to be big, so I'm going to start posting content, mm -hmm. so I'm the winner." I'm the winner. But again, what man, what inspires that mind where th that mind can just, see that? Just wake up and say, I don't know shit and I'm going to learn every day. Uh -huh. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm not sure we touched on this question or not about the, uh, your, the fatherhood, the father in the community. Got it. Got it. And, yeah. and, and the importance and value of that. I, I think it's super, again, I'm not a father, but I think it's super valuable, but I think it's valuable in many ways. Like, um, my nephews have an incredible father, but I would be very present in their life. So I think, I think instead of just like this title, I think it's like men in their community being closer to like maybe kids, uh, you know, like being able to show support. I think, I think the issue is that we're living in a world that we're too dynamic and that's not a bad thing because, again, I'm moving. But it's not like back in the day. So, like, even what, what I'm saying, people don't live in the neighborhood they grow up. Like, they, people don't do that no more. So, it's hard to, like, build a community attachment. Like, communities are dead. Mm -hmm. People move in. People move out. People want to go to other places. Mm -hmm. People are more mobile. People work remote. They're also more aware of what's around. Yeah, so what happens is that kid or that child that needed the community support by either grandmothers or people that are not, like, blood-related, it's harder now because things are dynamic. But I would say, in general, I think um, I think it's just men in general, I think should just look up, like, and see, hey, you know, what kid could probably use their help or even attention, not even help. Like, hey, you know what, I'm cleaning my car. And this kid, you know, you know, my nephew that, you know, he's a little lost or, you know, he's missing his dad. Mm -hmm. You know, let me just start having him clean the car with me so I could spend some time. I just think time with like good people could definitely impact others. You know, I, I, I don't have like a solution for that. I just think like it's just that I think people are are busy and the world is mobile and people should also not be having so many kids, you know, mm -hmm. and that that that's the other side. I think kids are incredible, but they're incredible, you know, in a household, not in like, right. not like thrown kid. around, right? Like five kids thrown around and things like that. Yeah. So that's indeed. that. <laughs> indeed. indeed. Great. Great. So my, my final question, if you can suggest one book or a piece of wisdom, a movie anything to our listeners to consume what would that be um i i would say it, one book a great book would be the steve jobs book um uh, what was the Gen well, well, walter isaac yeah 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 I, I would definitely check that out um and you know 
I think uh, <laughs> this is a side note, but The Godfather is still my favorite Yo, movie. I yeah, I think Definitely. I think Respect. Look, all three, part one, part two, part three. I think all three, all three are right. are like I think we a lot of times we say, oh, this this, this one bad. we like, but man, it it's a masterpiece it's throughout. Together. Yeah, I think I think it's uh it's still one of the best. Um, yeah, and and I would just say like you know, I would say write down the things that make you happy, or will make you happy, and work towards those things every day of your life, mm. and that's it. And you define what happiness is in your own way. My my girlfriend uh, taught me that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, just let everybody know how they can find you and. Yeah, so Instagram, July F. Grion, that's J-U-L-Y-F-G-R-U-L-L-O-N. And the company is nettyworth.io, that's N-E-T-T-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot I-O. Yeah. Indeed. And uh, as I told you before, brother, like, I'm happy for you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm sad that you have to leave. You know, I'll be flying. Yeah, I'll be flying back. Please, please just do me a favor. When you come back, give me like a week, two weeks in advance. <laughs> yeah. And we can just get some tea. You know, yeah, yeah, night. yeah. I would really appreciate that. But congratulations. I'm happy making that move to the to the mecca of technology. <laughs> yes. Again, yes. I remember when this was just an idea and I got a free shirt. Right? <laughs> and now you're this is this is just so amazing, man. But thank you for your generosity. Thank your you. Time. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you guys. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah.